would please mute your phones if you're on Zoom. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, continuing where we left off. Exodus? Uh, yep, Exodus. And we'll, we're going to begin in, the, in verse 8 of Exodus. But before we do that, let's uh, bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, <coughs> I do pray that you would just um, have your will in us. Uh, Lord, we come sometimes just not, not fully engaged, not fully uh, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we ask that you'd even help us in that, Lord. We ask that if we've been um, depleted, of your spirit that you would renew us and re replenish us fill us afresh to overflowing lord that we would have an excitement to hear from you and the ability to hear from you and see you uh, help us lord as we open up the word to be fed as we need lord and to grow in the grace and knowledge of jesus christ it's in his holy name that we pray amen amen all right if you could uh, again open up your bibles to to leviticus chapter six and beginning in verse eight there, as we as we start here, you know, obviously there's all these sections that are talking about the the sacraments and the sacrifices of the Israelites, uh, and and this is the birthing of these ceremonial services and sacrifices, which we're obviously we, we're going to say again and again and again, all are a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. They are all, they all were representation of our relationship that we would have through Christ. And so, uh, in the beginning of all of these is is the attitude that we should always have whether we go to prayer or whether we go to the word or whether we go uh, it, it, to make decisions in our life, whatever it may be, we want to we wanna remember this same verse that's been repeated multiple times throughout the Old Testament. And here in verse 8 it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The Lord is always speaking. The Lord looks all throughout the earth to and fro to see who will want to hear his voice, to hear the word. And he's willing to speak to us. He does, he's seeing who has the right heart, who has the mind, who seeks God's will, not their will. And he will speak to them. And so we're here today, and, and obviously we've prayed to hear from God. So this is Moses. He's there. He's always tentative to God's ear. He is the mediator, if you will, between the Israelites and God. And we know that we have a mediator right now, which is the Lord Jesus Christ between us and God. And yet we can come because of this mediator um, we've entered into this mediator, Jesus Christ, we can come boldly before God so we can hear the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is important. Um, as we go into this section from 8 to uh, 13, we're going to cover today, we're seeing that <clears throat> there's, there's these special um, ceremonial services and things that needed to take place for, for the priests for these people, again, that were set, a, set apart for the service of God. And so this first priest in the Bible that, that, that are being set apart in human priests are the Aaron, Nautic, or the Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Aaron and his sons. Oh. <laughs> and so this is this will then eventually turn into the Levites, and they'll take on a lot of the same sacraments and things like that. But he's going to speak specifically to this these priests of this time under Aaron. However... Again, we know that this is a shadow of what is to come. And so as we delve into this and we start to see this, spe this specific one about keeping the fire lit is, is kind of the, the title of this message is in, in this, this Bible study. We're going to see that it applies to us of the, the priests of Jesus Christ. And, and so as we delve into this, let's keep our eye open for that. And obviously I'll be pulling it out. So again, beginning, uh, continuing on in verse 9, it says, Command Aaron and his son saying this, is the law of the burnt offering. It is a burnt offering because it is a burning upon the altar all night and all morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. So this is a burnt offering, and this is really, you could say, a light offering or a fire offering or a consuming offering that is not just a normal uh, offering. This is a perpetual offering. This is a continual offering. This is not one that ever ends. This is meant to be an offering that once it's begun, and we're going we're gonna to learn about the miraculous way it is begun, but once it's begun, it will continue to burn forever. This was the intent. Obviously, the intent is a shadow of a fire that would come and burn forever. Um, but this burnt offering, because burnt offering upon the altar is better, um, this, this burnt offering um, shall be upon fire on the altar that it is to continually burn with which sacrifices were innumerable. In other words, forever again. And upon the altar and... 
the better rendering of this this scripture verse is the burnt offering shall be on the burning fire upon an altar all night and all morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it so this this is the special place where the fire would be kindled and the fire would be ignited and the fire would continue on and yet there would be offerings being made continually so it's not just the fire but the sacrifices that you're going to see that are being made continually one and, and the way it is is that the, they, they would actually light the fire well you'll see that the fire is already continued but they would come in the morning and put a sacrifice and they would have a lamb that they would slowly sacrifice throughout the entire day and then they would come up at, again at night at twilight and actually the night the day in israel begins at night as soon as the sun goes down so they would they would sacrifice all night long till the morning a lamb a piece by piece by piece by piece until the morning and you're going to see there's there's another another um task that they have to do at the end of the morning then they would take a lamb and do it again all night long all the while keeping this fire burning and we we know that jesus is this continued burning light or priest for us he's an, he is the light of the world coming to us to teach truth but to teach righteousness and holiness and a pure refining fire to keep all that's in him pure everything that comes to him is made pure everything in his presence is made pure and by the way everything will be made pure and come and be subdued unto him hebrews chapter 7 verse 3 says without without father or mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of god abideth a priest the priest continually so this position of the royal priesthood, we know that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek who's, who's one who had no parents in the Old Testament. Many believe is an epiphany of Christ. And so this priesthood is above all the other priesthoods. And when we enter into Christ uh, through being born again or through accepting him as our Savior, we become priests. We become a nation of priests. And it, someone was asking a question about the difference between a priest and a bishop. And I said, well, the bottom line is, is because everyone is a priest of christ if you come into christ you are made uh intercessor for the world you're made ambassadors of christ you're made lights in the world so this is this is our job here so christ and our lives here romans chapter 8 verse 34 says who is he that com that condemneth it is it is christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of the Father, who's making intercession on our behalf, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ or him that loved us. So what is this saying? We literally have become a perpetual light we have become a perpetual sacrifice remember we said this lamb was continually being piece by piece put in throughout the throughout the night and then throughout the day so we are to be these as priests of christ continually making sacrifice of ourselves day and night and this scripture that i just read was literally talking about the foundations of the church and the apostles that were that were living and, and denying their own lives so that they could teach the word of god and be christ here on this earth remember paul said to live is christ to gain to die is gain so while we're here and we're in christ we are literally the continuing of his sacrifice for the world not to condemn the world but that, uh, that through, the, through him, the world would be saved. So this perpetual sacrificing unto the Lord, a glorious uh, holiness unto the Lord. We bring ourselves a living sacrifice. Um, it says Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. This is what we're called into now. So you're seeing all of these things that they were meticulously doing ceremonially in the Old Testament, uh, these, like I said, the priests of Aaron and the priests of Levi, were what we are to do now, but in Christ. We are entered into Christ because he's fulfilled these in his sacrifice on the cross. So this is what we're doing, living this. And there's more to this. There's going to be keeping the light lit. So um this fire to shine light you know fire matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven this this um this 
would this place where this altar where this fire would be continually going was in the heart of the temple and it was right there in the holy area and people and they would be sitting there lighting this fire and there would be there would be incense and we know that there's bread sacrifice and we know there's lamb sacrifice so there'd be this this aroma always going but also this heat that would come from it and the illumination of that light that always be glowing from a burning heart um and 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 we know that that this scripture verse, although he's talking to them, and we're going to continue and move along a little bit more, but I wanted to really hit helm the foundations of this, this part of the scriptures that we're in. And, and this is just the instructions. Remember, um, God told Moses, and then what's Moses going to do? Tell, tell Aaron and the priest, right? He's going to continue to relay this. He's going to be the messenger. And this is just the instructions. But this is actually lived out or fulfilled when they start doing this in chapter 9 of Leviticus. And in chapter 9 verse 22 it said Aaron lifted up his hand towards the people and blessed them and came down uh from an off uh offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering all these ones we've talked about uh past chapters and Moses and Aaron went to the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people and there came a fire out from the Lord and consumed the altar of the burnt offering, which we're learning about today, and the fat, which all the people saw, and they shouted and fell down on their faces. So who lights the fire? God. This special altering that, that, that happened in this priesthood, they, they, I don't even know in the instructions if they knew that God would come and be the one to ignite this fire, but it's him who ignites the fire. Who ignites the fire in us? God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells within us and gives us this burning desire. Some of us have kind of lost that burning desire to know God, to be, to be um, a, a light in the, in the world and let your work so shine. And we've gotten discouraged and we're not learning for the word and getting on fire to know God even more and, and just being consumed. And so God's light is a fire, thus making it also what? Holy. God's a consuming fire. So why are we holy? You're going to see a, a couple of reasons, but it, it, it's that initial fire that comes inside our heart from the blood of the Lamb, and he sent now the fire of the Holy Spirit to make us holy vessels, lights separating us from the world. We are to be these beacons, uh, not to hide it. Um, from Eliot's commentary, it says, to put it properly, uh, uh, well, well let's, let's continue on in our scripture verses first. Um, so beginning in, uh, continuing on in verse 10, it says of Leviticus 6, and the priest shall put on linen garments, and the linen breeches shall he put on his flesh, and take up the ashes of the fire to consume with the burnt offering in the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And so right away there's this putting on not just the holy fire within our hearts, but a covering of righteousness, a clothing. And um, Eliot's commentary says that there's actually, although it's only mentioning two pieces of, of, of linen that's put here, the, the tradition is that there's four pieces. There's a tunic, which is as long as a robe, you know, fine linen with sleeves, um, that, that, uh, but without folds in it, a covering of the whole body, which reaches down to the feet. And then there's the linen breeches, which we just talked about, the, the, which is better, the linen drawers, with, uh, which according to authorities during the Second Temple reached to the knees and were fastened with ribbons by flanks. And a linen girdle, which wasn't mentioned here, that goes on top of that, which has embroidered special things, kind of like the, the uh, veil between God and the holiest of holies. There were special things embroidered in there. Um, and there was three, where was three fingers wide and uh, 32 cubits long, thinking of that, you know, that veil and in the, between the sanctuary. And then there's the fourth component, which is a miter, or better put, a turban on top of the head, which is likewise fine linen and was fastened to the head by uh, means of ribbons and to prevent it from falling off. So this is a shadow again of our clothes given to us by Christ that we're to put on. Isaiah 61 uh, verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me in garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So the Lord dresses us in these holy robes. And so these priests are dressed in these holy sacraments 
as they're keeping this fire going, as they're making the sacrifice perpetually. And, and this is not unlike us when we come into the altar of God. It's not that we're not always in the altar. Our, heart, our hearts are that altar. But we come to special places where we, we, we want to hear of God where we want to see the fire of God more. So we come to church and, and we break open the bread, the word of God, and, and it imparts to us this fire that kindles our hearts again. We ask and we seek God's face. And as we're there, we wear our best attire, right? Some of us dress up and I've been putting a tie on now. And this is part of the reason why is not because I think that you're better and you can't come to church with shorts and jeans and rip clothes just as you are. But it, I figure if I have them, why wouldn't I put on my best attire to come to these special places together? But nevertheless, as you're going to see as we continue on in verse 11, these priests are going to take off these holy robes once they're done with this sacrament and still have to go do work. We still have to take off our church clothes and get out into the world and put on regular clothes, like I said, and get dirty, you know, so to speak. So beginning in verse 11, it says that he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. You know, my first my first uh, take when I was reading this was, oh, it kind of reminds me of the sins, you know, that have been burned up and the Lord takes them from the east to the west. But that's a bad interpretation because because this, this is not, these are holy ashes. Matter of fact, what's, what's being said is that as these ashes are burned, they would have a tradition. They would come in in the morning and clean up and they would take a scoop and they would take it over to the east side of the altar and they would put it <coughs> in a special container <coughs> set aside. So then I've seen other theologians and other people's opinions of this and said, no, it's more like Jesus Christ when he's on the cross. And, and, and then they, they come and they take his body and they put it in a special sepulcher that's been set aside. And it's, it's kind of been, the, the sacrifice has been made. He's dead. You know, from ashes you were created to ashes you shall return, you know, back to the dust. And so his flesh was, again, dead and put into the tomb. And so it was a, still, nevertheless, remember, even then God was still holy. So even then, these were special ashes, and but yet they changed their clothes. They didn't take their you know their robes and their fancy robes and all these the, the breastplates and all the stuff that they had on. They went and they changed and they went and did work, just like us. You never stop being a priest of God, just because. You know, you're a pastor and you go up in front and you preach or you guys come to church and you're in your best clothes and you're ready to sing, oh, you know, and you're doing everything sacramentally, you know, that the Lord's kind of asked us to come together. Don't forsake the assembling together <coughs> and you dress in your best attire, your, your Sunday outfit or whatever. <coughs> when you go home and you change, you're still the same Christian. Just because your clothes have changed doesn't mean you have changed. You're still called to be that light. You're still called to be that priest or priestess in this life, right? We're still to be Christ on this earth and sacramentally, you know, sacrificially, still denying ourselves. <clears throat> and, and so this is, I think this is a better interpretation, as I said, of the ashes. And, and it's still a holy manner. It's still us going out into our job. We don't change who we are. We're still people chosen by God, these vessels of uh, to be filled, by the way, with that fire. So as we <coughs> close up in the last few scriptures, I apologize for the, <coughs> let me drink some water here. Um, verse 12 and 13, we're going to talk about this eternal flame a little bit more. So, so in uh, Leviticus chapter 12, it says, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. They shall not put it out, and the priest shall burn the wood in it every morning, and lay the burnt offering upon it, ordered upon it, and shall burn their fat in the peace offerings. Again, that continual offering all the time. And verse thirteen says, "And the fire <coughs> will never be burning, or will ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out." Now we know this fire indeed did go out. When they had stopped honoring the Sabbath day or resting in the work of the Lord. This fire started because of God, but yet he's asked us to keep it going. He's asked us to do things to keep it burning, to keep making that sacrifice, to keep being that sweet aroma, to continue to make living sacrifices unto the Lord, to continue to, to keep the fire stoked and, and, and wood into it. And so this is an eternal flame. According to Jews, it tells us that the fire never did go out upon the altar until they did not obey the Sabbath and they were taken away from 
the temple. Remember, they were taken out of the temple and they were brought into captivity in Babylon. The fire went out. At that point, and, and, and to this day, you know, some believe that they'll start to do sacraments again and they'll get the perfect heifer and all this other stuff. Once, you know, with DNA manipulation and all this other stuff, you know, once the Jews, once, once God is done with the Gentiles and he starts working again with the Jews, they will start this fire again. It'll be kindled again. But right now it's been put out with Israel. But Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, be not, you know, be not drunken with wine wherein to excess, but what are we to be filled with? The, the Holy Spirit, God, right? We're to be drunken and completely filled, keeping that fire going, the, the Holy Spirit within us. Acts chapter 4, verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God in boldness. So this natural, just like the fire came down and was ignited by God, the Holy Spirit was sent down by God upon the whole earth. And those that were believing on the, on the, on the gospel of Christ were filled with fire, a holy fire. It says as though tongues of fire were above them. And, and some thought they were drunk. And some thought, no, and Paul says it's the midday. They're not drunk. This is the promise of God upon us that we would be ignited on fire with holy boldness and holy, holy knowledge. Um, even the knowledge that you would need no man to teach you. Not that we're not to study the scriptures to know God deeper and have a deeper relationship, but the knowledge that he's your father, that Jesus Christ is the son of God, would be put in you that no man would need to teach you this. Your spirit would burn and, 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 and want more of him and desire him. And second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by, by one spirit you were baptized into one body, whether we be Jews, Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, uh, having been made all, uh, been all made to drink in one spirit. So this is the same fire that ignites us. There's not different fires. There's no strange fires. It's the same Holy Spirit that ignites us into one body, one altar for the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it's all our hearts that we have to keep individually as priests burning. Remember, we're going to close with this. What does, what's the parable that Jesus gave to the people warning them that talks about this? It's about the ten virgins, if you remember. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 uh, through 13, Jesus is telling this story. It says, And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. And they, were, they that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. And remember, the oil is the Holy Spirit. And took no oil with them, but the wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye to meet him. Then all the virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. In other words, they were continually filling their, their lamps. And you're going to see this is speaking more than just the filling of the lamp. Isn't just coming and asking the Spirit so I can be powerful and mighty. Hey, brother. And, and, and mighty, in, in, you know, to, to, to be... Um, powerful and and have love and have a sound mind it's so much more than that why do we study the scriptures why has god imparted them to us say it say it no you know why do we study the scriptures no god to, to, no who god. said it Me. christine to know god this is why we're here to know him more and when we're dwelled with the with the holy spirit we do know him we are filling ourselves to get that, to get more of, of that relationship with him, the more of his holy presence within us, to keep that holy fire burning so it doesn't squatch out. Have you seen churches, how they say in America they're starting to Peter and everything? Why? Because they're not living sacrifices. They're not continually to stoke it. They're not be, you know, being, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And so they're losing their fire. They're no longer making an impact in this world and letting people, letting God be known because they know God. As a matter of fact, their own knowledge of God is petering. And so it says, but rather go you and sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they were not, and they, they that were ready went in with him into marriage and the door was shut. Not unlike the, the ark when the flood was about to come. Us that are in will be prepared, ready, and we'll know 
the time. Because we're always looking for our bridegroom. We're always looking for the return of Christ. And he's and we're on fire waiting for this. And we're going to be excited and we're going to run with our lamps full of the knowledge of God. And afterwards came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered them and said, Verily I send to you, I know you not. Watch therefore for, you, for neither the day nor the hour. You know not neither the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. So, Again, this is this continual, the, 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 us Christians need to continually be seeking the knowledge of God and continually be filled and, and, and to be afresh. It, it's not enough to rest on the laurels of the, the fire that initially was put into your heart, but we need to always be coming back to the Lord daily, not just on Sunday, not just on Thursdays, not just on prayer on Tuesday nights, but every single day. And by the way, not just daily, every moment. I can tell you how many times does the flesh rise up and you start to get in an argument with someone. This is the time to stoke that fire, to continually make a living sacrifice. Put yourself to death and let Christ live in there and let the Spirit have its will in your life. Every moment when depression starts to come, when these things start to come, and the Bible says, bring into captivity every thought and let the Holy Spirit subdue the flesh and the flesh nature. This is continual. Burn it, right? Burn it, and the Lord will make it holy. The Lord will make it. And this is like putting to death you as Christ died on the cross. Now we know we will never die, us who are in Christ, because Christ will never be put to death again. Right? It's been done once and for all, but we need to enter into his work, like these priests of the old. So that's where we're going to close for today. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly uh, Father, I thank you for your word. We thank you <clears throat> that you're a well that never runs dry, that we can always come to the living water and let it flow in and through us, Lord God, and even out of us, that we would be the lights and the beacon of Christ Jesus while we're here on this earth, that we would be those living sacrifices, that you would receive the glory that's due your name, that all would look to you, Father, um, and, 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 and in the same spirit surrender themselves, knowing that you're going to bring life. We can give you nothing good, but what we give you, you make good. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for the living sacrifice and for the Holy Spirit that you've given us to be our counselor, to be our cleanser, to be our, our, our imparter of knowledge, the imparter of good gifts. Thank you for all that you're going to do with each and every one here who moves by faith and takes hold of this by faith. Fill us afresh with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.